You don't have a time limit, do you, Manos? Uh, no, I mean, it's technically one hour for the seminar. Uh, if we're not done and you feel like you need to go a little further. No, no, um, I, meant, I meant with uh, Zoom. With recording, no. It's just, it should be fine. Okay, give it 30 seconds and we can get started. What order are we going in? So Brad's going to start off, then uh, Johan is going to continue, and then you can talk about, uh, you know, AA secretary plus anything else you, you want, and then Ed will end with uh, some more, uh, you know, Arlo the Friend stories. Okay. All right. Uh, so I want to thank you all for coming. It's a special seminar today as we gather to... Uh, to uh, remember our late colleague and friend, uh, Arlo. And uh, we have some of uh, his oldest colleagues here at LSU PDS uh, who've known him for several decades, um, talking to us about some of his greatest scientific achievements, as well as some fun story of um, being friends with Arlo. So we're gonna start off with, uh, with Brad, uh, who's gonna, for the next 15 minutes, talk about Arlo the astronomer and uh, share some of his impressive contributions. So Brad, you can share your screen um, whenever you're ready. Yeah, howdy. Can hear and see? Yes. Oh, okay, fine. Um, well, anyway, uh, we are all here for a remembrance and a celebration and as the first speaker, uh, I, I think it's my task to, to, to go through the many aspects of his very storied career. Um, he, he's had a, a life unlike uh, most everyone else here. Um, it kind of starts, uh, well, okay, he was born in 1935 in rural Indiana. This is depression before the, this, this uh, rural America during the depression, middle America. And I think that has colored a large amount of Arlo's personality. Um, one of the, the, the stories he, he liked to tell, uh, which was still kind of evocative and astounding to us modern people, um, uh, he, even the older modern people, is that um, he, for the first many years, uh, grew up uh, with his education in a one-room schoolhouse. You know, this is little house on the prairie where one teacher would teach eight different grades all at once and you grew up through this it's it's just a different world than what we have for for modern education um, but he obviously did good um, he went off to university at miami university got his degree in 1955 fair enough he then applied to and got into indiana university to be an observer uh, for phd to, uh, to be an observer at Gothelink observatory fair enough but in the first year, he actually went off on an adventure, uh, a, kind of a unique one. Um, it was for the International Geophysics Year. This was uh, more like a year and a half, but this is a year where many countries in the world did all sorts of exciting new original geophysics sorts of experiments. This is when uh, uh, it was part of IGY that they launched the Sputnik and the US space program got going. IGY was when you had all the, um, the, the seafloor bottoms being mapped out and people were working out what happened with, um, with continental drift. And there were, there were huge pushes to be done in the Arctic and Antarctic. And no one had really spent much time in the Antarctic. And so uh, Arlo uh, went and became one of the team of people who were wintering over at the South Pole. First people to winter over at the South Pole. Um, you know, I think there hadn't been very many people at the South Pole at all. It's the Amundsen, Scott, and, 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 and Bird. You know, I'm not sure there was anyone else who had been at the South Pole. Anyway, they went down to the South Pole. There were nine scientists and nine CBs, and they spent the whole bloody winter there. Um, and that's gotta be, a a, a, a bone chilling experience in many different ways. Arla's job was to observe Aurora, um, the Aurora Australis, which largely hadn't ever really been observed. 
Um, and so he would be taking, um, uh, for some type of observations, hourly observations, 24 hours a day for half a year. Wow. Okay, so all this data, uh, I think that uh, he told me that the main point of it was they were comparing the, um, the aurora australis, looking for time coincidences and more, uh, with the aurora borealis. That is, trying to understand how uh, incoming solar protons would go uh, interacting with the both poles. And so he's the first person to go off and do that. Okay, fine. Um, uh, so here, here's a picture of the entire crew, including the puppy dog that was uh, wintered over. And how many of you who haven't already seen this picture can pick out Arlo in here? Um, most of us have a picture in our mind of Arlo, and this person here is not it. Anyway, that is Arlo. Here's another picture of Arlo with a little bit better close-up. And can you recognize Arlo in this? I'm not sure Eunice could recognize this in Arlo. Um, and the, the, the place I got this picture from claims that Arlo is off here making uh, ice cream. And who would want to make ice cream at the South Pole? <laughs> well, anyway. Um, and uh, so, so I've collected just a couple pictures from the Antarctic experience. And over here is one picture which is not original of Arlo. I have seen the original of Arlo doing this, and this is a actually a good modern reproduction. This is what happens when the temperature gets down to minus 120 degrees. Oh, you know, only at the South Pole. When the temperature got down to minus 120 degrees, all of the people stripped to the buff, other than shoes, and dashed outside, dashed around the South Pole mark dashed back in and quickly went into the sauna to try and desperately warm up. You know, this is kind of one of these crazy frat tricks or something like that. A anyway, um, this whole uh, 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 um, uh, naked dash around the South Pole at a hun minus 120 degrees, um, uh, that has since turned into a regular institution and apparently uh, uh, they are still doing this at multiple times a year, even now. Uh, who would have thought? Anyway, Arlo starting a, 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 a streaking fad going to, to, to modern day. Well, he came back from uh, Antarctica. Things went well, uh, very nice. And he returned back to Indiana University, got his PhD under John Irwin, who is a, cl uh, a classy, a photometrist, and that's where Arlo learned his trade from, although he clearly advanced quite far past what, what, um, what Irwin could have told him. His PhD was on photometry, of course, of um, uh, uh, two open clusters, very typical sort of Arlo sort of thing to do. Well, once he got back in, uh, in, in the PhD program, he started needing large amounts of telescope time. And this was just at the time when Kitt Peak Observatory in Tucson or near Tucson uh, was starting up. And so Arlo was a frequent observer at Kitt Peak. And for a number of the telescopes, he was the, the, the earliest observer of them. Uh, for one of the telescopes, he was both the first and the last observer uh, of that particular telescope up on Kitt Peak. Here's a picture of him. Uh, this is a daytime picture. Uh, but, but back in the heyday here, and it shows the typical setting. Now, observing back in the uh, 60s, 70s, and even into the 80s was a greatly different experience than it is now. Uh, observing back then was a, 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 vicious isn't the right word, a very hard task. You'd have to, um, because just the act of observing, uh, they didn't have auto guiders, so you'd have to uh, very twiddly tweak things to, to keep things centered. You'd have to change apertures. You'd have to do simultaneous notes on your strip chart recorder to keep track of what you're observing when. And, um, and all of this was done for the entire night. Typically, you're the only person in the telescope. You never see anyone else. And <laughs> in some of the cases, there weren't even other people on the mountain. And the, the nights were long, especially the winter nights. Holy cow. 
you're up on the top of a freezing mountaintop and it gets cold when you're standing around just tweaking your hands for um, uh, and, and not doing anything else. Um, it took real fortitude to become an observer. It was a hard task and he persevered and he kept using huge amounts of telescope time. So uh, for, uh, he also then started extending it to uh, going down to Chile for Ceratololo once uh, Ceratololo got started. And again, he was the first observer of many of those telescopes down there. Um, Arlo told me that he had 170 trips to and from Chile. Holy cow, you know, e even amortizing it over 55 years of, of observation, that's a lot of telescope time, and that's a lot of observing trips, especially because the earlier trips, they tended to be week or month long observing runs. So what Arlo was doing with this time was not only uh, uh, making standard stars, which I'll talk about in a moment, but he was also using his photometer uh, and later CCD photometer to um, measure the brightness, light curves of many different stars. And he was very eclectic and he collected huge number of observations of many different stars of many different types. Um, uh, before I got to LSU, there were three or four uh, uh, papers um, where, uh, where uh, for stars, random stars, I was working on that Arlo had uh, the best, or in some cases, the only previous observations of. Whoa, when I got here to LSU, uh, there were um, j just talking in the halls. I would be telling Arlo about, oh, hey, I've been off looking at V101, uh, V1017 SAG, and it'd say, oh, I got a lot of unpublished observations on that. And so <laughs> just random stars that I have picked out, um, there were three of them that he had large amounts of observations on, and so we just went in on a joint publication. But that's to show that he has a huge amount of observations on many different stars. Many of them were relatively speculative observations. He didn't quite know what was going on. And one of them paid off very big. He um, was looking at a particular, well, uh, here's the title of it, uh, a, a particular blue variable that turned out to be periodic. And it turned out to be a white dwarf. And it turned out to be the very first, the discovery of pulsating white dwarfs. Now, there, there aren't very many people around who have discovered their own class of variable star. He's one of them. And the pulsating white dwarfs have turned out to be a relatively important uh, 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 class of, of, of these stars. Well, um, back in 1965, he joined the LSU facility, uh, the LSU facility and faculty. Um, and he's been here ever, or uh, has been here ever since. Um, and he has long become the mainstay, the, the heart and the throb of, uh, of the whole department. Um, so he's kept up as observing at least till, uh, till 2012. And to show you how times have changed back from the old days of, of great hardship at, uh, to, just to get some simple observations. Uh, here's Arlo uh, with a modern day, easy sort of thing where you're, you're sitting in a warm observing room and you're doing everything remotely by a computer. Boy, the times have changed. Um, Arlo is best known um, justifiably for the Landolt standards. Well, Landolt standards are stars up in the sky scattered around the equator for which Arlo has measured their magnitudes in a variety of uh, color band passes um, to very high accuracy. And they're reliable. And these are standard stars. And standard stars are required for doing any amount of photometry. And the photometry, uh, the standard stars have to be accurately calibrated. You have to know exactly how bright these things are if you're going to try and find out uh, the relative brightness of your target star. So the standard star program has been uh, by far and away uh, Arlo's largest one, and it's by far and away the most important one. And so he's been working at this. I have a list down here at the bottom. You don't have to read them all. The point is he has a lot of papers. Um, starting, the first one I could find was in 1967, though I've never used that one. Um, and the last of the publications was in 2013. And um, James, uh, you're on here. You might be able to update as to whether I got the last one or not. 
Anyway, the Landolt standards are important. They're foundational for astrophysics. Things build on it. If you're ever doing photometry, you're building on the Landolt standards. Uh, they're foundational. And so I estimate, you know, this is hard to quantify and hard to know, but something like 10% of modern astrophysics has Landolt standards at their foundation. Let me give you an example. For the Supernova Cosmology Project, we went off and discovered dark energy. You know, we're talking big time, new startling physics. The entire program is required. It, it's based on doing exacting photometry of, of supernovae. And you had to get it really accurate. And th there were a lot of problems with, with, with all this, but it all come down to, you have the base of the Landolt standards. So the, the Landolt standards, it's hard to overstate the importance of, of the Landolt standards here. But when you come back and say, you know, uh, well, a guesstimate, it's gonna be something of order, 10% of all modern astrophysics has Landolt standards in their foundation. That's saying it's very important. Um, a while back, there was a, a, a study uh, going through all the papers in astrophysics and uh, Arlo's uh, key number one paper was turned out to be uh, something like, and I'm not sure the details, but it, it was the most cited of all astrophysics papers. And that's actually saying a lot. And actually a lot more should be said about that because um, the citation count for papers like Arlo's are grossly undercounted because there are a large number of people out there, a large number of papers which used Landolt standards, but then did not bother to go off and give the reference to the foundation of their work. So who, who knows what the exact number is, but, but the real number of, of papers using Landolt standards has got to be uh, of order magnitude more than that, that was actually cited. So Landolt standards are probably the way that Arlo was best known uh, around the world. And uh, there you go. It's hard to overstate their importance there. There's a lot of other things that Arlo has been doing. Um, maybe the way at which many of the astronomers, uh, many of the non-observing astronomers in America know of Arlo is because he was AAS secretary for uh, two nine-year periods, which basically span the time when much of us were, were hanging around. And throughout much of the rest of the time, he was always the one present. So Arlo as a secretary with such a long tenure, he became the corporate memory. He became the person who actually knew everyone and knew everything that was going on. He became the, the visible presence of the AAS. And so we all uh, know when we first met Ar uh, Arlo, well, it was either at, at Kit Peak or Saratololo or um, at an AAS meeting. And this picture here is a little bit uncharacteristic of Arlo because he's wearing this hat. Otherwise he's wearing his um, official suit and tie uh, with the glasses on. Uh, Arlo served in a, 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 any of a number of other uh, official positions in many other organizations, all very high level sorts of things. He was awarded a variety of prizes. Um, and uh, here at LSU, we had uh, the, an Arlo Fest. This is back in 2015. This is uh, your usual Fest Trift conference that had about 100 of uh, top name American astronomers, actually worldwide astronomers coming around, um, all honoring Arlo, which shows um, the, 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 the depth of his feeling and his help and his, and, and his effect throughout the astronomy community. Um, there are a variety of other ways which Arlo is commemorated. There's Mount Landolt in Antarctica. It happens to be right here, and um, it's at the head of two different glaciers, and the surface area of these glaciers is comparable to the state of Rhode Island. Um, I guess that doesn't mean too much. Um, now, uh, on this map of, Ant of Antarctica, it's at the base of the Palmer Peninsula, and Arlo spent his time down at the South Pole and over here at McMurdo. So Arlo never actually got to see Mount Landolt, although it was named for him. Um, and as far as I know, Mount Landolt has never yet been climbed. Um, there's also Arlo, uh, uh, there's also an, uh, an asteroid named for Arlo. And this was one discovered by Walt Cooney, an amateur, and Pat Modell, who's now at Indiana, isn't he, I think. Um, uh, they made the, discovered the asteroid out at uh, Highland Road, fair enough. And here's the citation that they made for him, which 
which um, this is uh, the citation for his asteroid is actually a pretty good remembrance of him. There you go. And um, I've, I've looked up on JPL Horizons, the, the uh, uh, ephemeris and observing conditions for um, uh, asteroid 15072 Landolt at the time of discovery. And it was around 19th magnitude. And I have a hard time understanding how um, uh, Walt and Patrick could have seen that faint, but they obviously did. Mm -hmm. um, the asteroid itself, it's just an ordinary main belt asteroid, never gets particularly close to Earth, so it's not a danger to anyone. So here we have an asteroid which is not a danger to anyone and mildly eccentric. There you go. That's probably fitting in many ways. <laughs> um, and then another commemoration for Arlo is one that, well, when you're on campus, you can walk up to the roof of Nicholson and see the Landolt Observatory. Landolt Observatory has a nine inch Alvin Clark telescope, uh, 11 and a half inch Alvin Clark telescope. Um, and that in itself is a very storied brand. Um, there are whole societies and books uh, devoted to them. Anyway, uh, LSU has our own Alvin Clark telescope, which, which sends a little, even now sends a little bit of shivers down my spine over here. Um, and it was built in 1939. And Back into the 90s, it, it was used very heavily for public nights and actually for some research. Um, some of the photographs that Arlo made with this telescope are still in the, um, the big room opposite uh, Arlo's old office. And uh, actually yesterday, I got an inquiry from Brian Skiff asking, hey, um, make sure that those plates, we actually need those plates. Could you make sure that those plates don't get thrown away? And that's actually a little bit of a, a, of a worry here for Arlo, is he, uh, he, he's often pointed out that he spent his whole career um, building up the, uh, uh, the astronomy facilities, the library, and the, 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 the data um, for uh, astronomy. And times have kind of moved on a little bit. Um, no one's using paper article, paper journal articles anymore. And there's ADS, which will find things faster and easier and sure. Um, but Arlo is always very anxious that the, the, the hard copy of the library that he worked so hard doesn't get tossed away. And the same, well, I, I heard from Brian Skiff last night that um, the same holds for um, much of the data that he has floating around, many of those plates. Um, so that might be one way at which we could go uh, remembering and commemorating Arlo is making sure that his legacy in the, 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 the physical parts of astronomy in our department aren't just willy-nilly tossed out. Well, but the Landolt Observatory um, got, went into disrepair in the 1990s, um, and it was only around 2006 that, the, uh, that we got around to um, actually uh, renovating it and making it usable again. It's not useful for any uh, research purposes, but it's a wonderful telescope for public outreach. And so it's been used for that ever since. And um, uh, on the renovation, um, there was a dedication of the observatory, which previously had no name. And the new dedication was the Landolt Astron Astronomical Observatory. And maybe I should close simply by reading the remembrance here. Uh, so the Landolt Astronomical Observatory is in, um, in recognition of Arlo U. Landolt, setting standards for astronomy and, um, and, for, <laughs> and, uh, uh, for astronomy at LSU and around the world. Thank you so much, Brad. That was excellent. <clears throat> a great way to start that commemoration. Uh, lots of uh, nice stories there. And that would lead us to Johan now. Uh, so Johan, if, if you want to share your slides and pick up from where Brad I'll left. do that. Um, so I'll touch up on some of the things that um, um, Brad already talked about, so, but I'll, I'll try and say something uh, that he did not mention. So let's see, can you see that slide? That's the... Um, yeah, looks good. That's, that's good. 1957 
visit to the South Pole, and Arlo was there, and his, as it was mentioned, his role was to uh, take images of the aurora and the the South Pole aurora, and uh, that was achieved with a specially built camera that uh, was able to image the entire sky uh, using um, um, a convex reflecting mirror, and that then sent through with a flat secondary sent through that through the center of that mirror into a, a camera, and that's how they produced the shots of the of the um, aurora australis. So here is a picture of one, and this is, by the way, the modern version of uh, the South Pole Amundsen Scott Station, which of course now is much better and uh, uh, you know improved uh, building and so on. It was much more primitive back in 1957. And another thing that uh, he was doing was recording uh, the spectra of airglow. And this is just a picture of the airglow above Cerro Paranal with, in Chile. But um, that is that glow that you see. It's actually coming from the uh, atmosphere itself. There is some excitation left over by um, the sun during daytime and then at at night it glows. Uh, sometimes a air glow is called also night glow for that reason. Um, but there are also chemical reactions of uh, with uh, free hydroxyl uh, floating around that then reacts with uh, oxygen and nitrogen that produces also some uh, faint lights of chemical origin. And uh, it just turns out that the in general, the air glow is strongest at about 10 degrees above the horizon. And so uh, they had a camera that was mounted on a specially modified turntable, you know, that uh, was cranked down so that it would turn around its axis in 24 hours. And so that was, of course, it was nighttime all the time, but this was during the day, quote unquote, as he refers to it in his. 1958 uh, PSP paper and uh, took pictures on, uh, took actually a spectra of the air glow. Um, so Brad also mentioned, um, uh, showed these pictures. And uh, so here is Alu again smoking his pipe. Um, the pipe still exists, is my <laughs> understanding. And there he is, the two pictures that were also in common with what Brad showed. So I won't say much about it. These are the two clusters that Arlo uh, worked uh, in, in his early career. So the next couple of papers he actually published uh, with uh, Robert Kraft and uh, they were looking for um, eclipse, eclipsing variables in these uh, open clusters. So. M25 and also NGC 6087, they both have the characteristic that they possess uh, at least one uh, classical Cepheid. And so these photometric observations and photometric sequences, Arlo actually observed close to 2000 stars between the two clusters, um, together with the information on eclipsing variables were very important at the time to improve the, uh, the distance scale and also to try and understand the sizes of these early massive stars. So even from this early, early, early papers, he was doing this important work. And these papers were published uh, um, right about the 62, 63, and he has, Brad mentioned he graduated in 64 and continued working on photometry and standard stars, something that now has been discussed um, already by, by Brad. So um, Arlo was also very aware that many of the frustrations of our modern life uh, are created by us, by ourselves. And he was very fond of this cartoon, um, the um, 
possum pogo possum or possum pogo cartoons. They were very popular way back in the um, 50s and, and so on. Actually, they were around in between 48 and 75. They no longer published. But uh, that's one of his famous quotes that I have, we have met the enemy and he is us. Arlo was very fond of mentioning that. Another thing that you may have heard him say is, especially in uh, the last few years where he was occasionally frustrated by um, problems with the software and he would come and ask help from various people and he, he, he got pretty upset at times as has been mentioned by other people. I think, uh, I think James already had an anecdote about that the other day. And um, one of the things that he used to say frequently is this quote that you may have, oops, I, seems like I lost it, but I'll try and find it. Yes, I seem to have lost it. Oh, there it is. So I was trying to explain once to him what was going on with one of the, the sources of his frustration. And he said, well, whatever it is, it's enough to make a preacher cuss frequently quoted by Arlo. And I'll leave you with that as a remembrance. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Johan. Thank you so much. Um, and so why don't we proceed with Jeff to say a few things, if, if Jeff is around. I'm here. Hello, Jeff. Uh, I'm just going to walk down the hall. Uh, where I'm going to go to Arlo World. Johan, you can stop sharing your screen, your uh, slides, if you want. Yes. You can see Jeff. We still so don't I see thought, me. Yes. Uh, oh. There we go. <laughs> so, um, as some of you may know, there's not only Arlo has an office, but he has another yes. large area. Um, Arlo was a collector. And uh, pretty much everything you can imagine that we acquired over 60 years, we still have. So um, I'm just going to switch my camera here. And uh, we're now in uh, Arlo World. And uh, just going to show a few things, uh, of course, uh, starting with the typewriter. Uh, and uh, we still have a nice case full of slides if you want to have a slideshow. All of these uh, um, things are full of Arlo stuff. Um, he also kept the library here. These are um, strange things. Uh, these are journals on paper. Um, very, very unusual uh, thing here. Just, uh, I actually had about 30 years worth of paper abjays myself, uh, which I uh, have now got rid of. But, um, so we're gonna go into the inner sanctum here and uh, take a look at what observing was like back in the day. Um, Brad uh, alluded to some of this stuff already. Um, yeah. When you went to an observatory, you would uh, find copies of these two books. These are the two most important books in astronomy, the Astronomical Almanac and the Observer's Handbook. Every observatory had them. And um, you have to understand that this is pre-internet. And when Arlo started observing in the late 50s, it wasn't that different from when I started observing in the late 70s. And uh, if you wanted to find anything like when the sun set on a particular night or um, when astronomical twilight ended uh, or the coordinates of bright stars, you had to go look them up on paper. And so um, everybody had these books. Um, this is the astronomical, <laughs> these are the 2022 versions, just so you know that I still have them. <laughs> Um, anyway, here in uh, this is this lovely room, uh, which is full of, again, 
some relics of past times. Here is a film projector and films. Um, one of the other really nice things in here are these things hanging on the wall. These are nine track tapes. Um, <laughs> um, some people are having bad flashbacks already, um, but we used to store our data on these tapes and uh, we had these huge um, tape machines, which you can see in old movies. Um, and uh, the tapes were not easy to load or read. Um, Anyway, so um, obviously if we wanted to look at uh, star charts, we had to go um, to paper. And so here in this nice drawer is the Palomar Sky Survey. Um, and um, so this is the uh, images that were taken uh, with the Schmidt camera at, on Mount Palomar. It's a 48 inch special camera, which took these lovely pictures. Um, I'm just showing one at random here. Um, this is the actual size. Uh, these things were taken uh, on uh, glass plates, but they were this big actually. And each of these uh, pictures covers six degrees by six degrees on the sky. So it's actually huge. Um, if you were to put the moon on this picture, it would be about the size of a quarter. Um, so if you wanted to observe, you had to uh, actually uh, get the coordinates of the star that you wanted to observe. And um, then you had to go and find a chart uh, showing that star. And then, so when you went to the telescope, you point the telescope and then you would compare um, what you saw to, uh, to the, the charts of the sky. <clears throat> um, just to give you an idea, um, this was going out, just going out of style when I started uh, my career, but, um, this is an example of a glass plate. And I'm just gonna hold it up uh, to, this, to the light here. But uh, so this is a plate of glass with a emulsion on one side. Um, if you observe back then, you had to learn how to uh, know whether you were putting the plate in the right way uh, in the dark. And uh, the way you did that was by licking it. Um, it was sticky on one side. <laughs> um, anyway, about the time that I started my uh, career in the late 70s, the first digital detectors were just being invented. The Reticon came out about the time I started grad school. And so I never actually did my observing with, with uh, plates, um, but I did spend a lot of time on this uh, little device here, this is known as the iris photometer. I spent a whole summer between uh, my uh, third and fourth years undergraduate working uh, at the David Dunlop Observatory measuring glass plates with this device, which was used to measure the brightness of stars off, directly off plates. And I was looking at variable stars in globular clusters. Uh, working for the famous Helen Sawyer Hogg. Um, anyway, um, I'm getting lost in here. It's uh, a wonderful place to come if you want to see what the world was like uh, when Arlo started out. Um, Brad was mentioning that uh, the both the Saratololo and um, Kitt Peak Observatories, Kitt Peak San Arizona, of course, Tolos and Chile, uh, were being built at just at the time that Arlo was starting his career. And um, he was observing uh, at Kitt Peak when they were blasting for the <laughs> two of the telescopes. And then when he first went down to Tololo, uh, <clears throat> they were just building the telescopes there as well. Uh, there's three observatories that were there back then, uh, Tololo, Las Campanas, and La Silla. La Silla is the European one. Um, Arlo uh, told me once how he had ridden a horse from one observatory to the other. Um, growing up on a farm does have its uses. 
anyway, um, just wanted to uh, show you this room. Um, we are going to be going through all this stuff in the near future uh, to see what should or can be saved. Um, and people are welcome to uh, help us out with that. Or if you're just interested in uh, seeing uh, a real picture of the sky on paper, <laughs> um, then uh, let me know. Anyway, uh, that's it for today, Manos. Thank you, Jeff. Fantastic uh, tour of the Arlo world. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, there's so some- can, uh, I, yeah. can I ask a question from Jeff? You talked about the iris photometer, right? There, the, and you yep. were trying to determine magnitudes of things. You would have to find some standard on that same plate. Is that right? Uh, so it, it's basically, it, it measures the density of, of a negative, a photographic right. negative. And right. uh, so, yes, on each uh, plate, there would be standards and, uh, and then the ones that you didn't know the, the magnitude of, yes. So therefore, you needed a lot of standards to cover all well, the Well, the other thing, yes. of course, is that the photographic plate is not a, it, not a linear detector like the CCDs that we use today. Right. And um, so... Uh, and it was also much less sensitive. Um, the sensitivity of CCDs is amazing. It's like 80%, which means it detects 80% of the photons that hit it. Uh, photographic emulsion is about 1%. Um, that's one of the reasons we can observe things much faster and much fainter than we used to. But, uh, but you also have to be careful in, with photographic plates if it's uh, too many photons or too few photons. Uh, it gets very nonlinear. Um, so that was part of the fun. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, there is also a very interesting conversation going on in the chat with regards to the Iris uh, diaphragm photometer um, and some other planetarium, which I didn't know the existence of, the Clinton Observatory, oh, where yeah. Arlo was instrumental. Oh, yeah. I can just show you this too. I did, I tried, but this is a uh, measuring engine for measuring uh, lines on the spectrum. And the, you could take spectra with plates as well. And you would put your plate in here and then manually measure the Doppler shifts or the wavelengths of the lines by just uh, turning these screws. I can't actually see this, the chat right now. I'm on my phone. Yeah, so uh, Brad saying that the Iris diaphragm, uh, diaphragm of photometer of Arlo is the only working IDP outside of a museum. For some project, an IDP is required, and those projects have got to LSU to work it out. So that's, uh, that's a great story there. Um, and as far as the Clinton Observatory goes, that, that was a, a question raised by Greg. Brad said that the Clinton Observatory was sold lock, stock, and barrel to a group of amateur associations in Houston and is now doing great service as an EPO facility outside um, Houston. Uh, so thank you all for uh, submitting those, uh, those notes. Uh, and this will bring us to uh, uh, our last speaker for today. We're also gonna have uh, some uh, thoughts shared by James Clem, who worked of course with Arlo uh, for years. Uh, but before we do, we, we also have Ed, who was a really close friend of Arlo's and together they had a lot of ice cream over at the dairy shop. So uh, <laughs> we want to hear more stories like that. So go ahead, Ed. Just a few stories, yeah. <clears throat> As you know, I'm not an astronomer, but my friendship with Arlo goes back to 1966 when I joined the department. That's now looking at it 56 years ago. So I think I can give you a picture of Arlo off campus, and that's what I want to do today, uh, from my point of view, of course. Now, we know that Arlo, we all know that Arlo, when he was at the university, was in a suit and tie. Mm -hmm. Some people might say this is old school, and in some ways it was, but Arlo, in a way, was old school. He, in his way of thinking, he dressed that way to be respectful to the institution and the students. That was his thinking. But Arlo dressed for the occasion most times. And uh, I'm gonna tell you about that in a little while. <laughs> Arlo came to LSU in 1962 and he and Ray Grenchik, not too many of you will know, remember, remember Ray Grenchik. They were the only astronomers in the department and it was largely a teaching program. But Arlo had plans, of course, as you can see from the previous three talks, 
to make it a research enterprise. So when I came in 1966, it was still Arlo and Ray making the astronomy, making up the astronomy faculty. But in the time of, this was the time of science development. So the department with Arlo's leadership began hiring additional faculty in astronomy leading to where we are today. Now, <clears throat> getting back to personal things, early, in those early years, that's the late 60s, early 70s, a number of us had young children. And as you all mostly know, Arlo had five young daughters. So a group of five such faculty or people, mostly ISU people, got together and spent extended day Labor Day weekends together at Pensacola Beach. This went on for many years. And Arlo, you know, you have to have, would have to have seen him then, was an avid participant in swimming and in beach activities. But one of the things he entertained us the most with was his puns, which he got mostly from his comic reads, and his jokes, which often were so dry they were very good. <laughs> but he, he was fun to be with. One vivid memory I have of those uh, years at the beach was that he came with the same book every year. He called it his beach book. It was a three inch thick history of the world. And uh, I think it had 1200 pages. He can read it only at the beach. Uh, you know, after, after astronomy, our passion was history, historical things and reading history. So that fit, but I think he finished, actually finished the book uh, before the kids grew up and we stopped going to the beach as a group. But however, that group stayed together, attending plays, gathering for holidays, dinner parties. And occasionally there'd be a dinner party, which was rather unique. Now this goes back to the early eighties. Most of you will think this is kind of funny, but this is the way it was back then. There was something called games called how to host the murder. And these were fun. Often at the time they were fun anyway, uh, where you would have a dinner and then a murder mystery to solve. Uh, the host would send out something to the dinner people a week or so before telling them what character they're gonna be, telling a little bit what the story was about what character they were going to be, and you'd have to dress up as that character. Uh, dinner would match as much as possible to the murder and fault. One, for example, I want to just give you one because it was my favorite. It was called Pasta, Passion, and Pistols. I'm telling this because it tells us something about Arlo. The dinner was Italian. I think we had stroganoff. No, no, that'd be German. I think we had lasagna. That's what it was. And uh, the, the victim, murder victim, was the owner of the restaurant, and Arlo was his son. His actual name was called Marco Roni. <laughs> so Arlo came, but Arlo was not, uh, he, he was a professional soccer player. So he came dressed as a soccer player with everything, a complete outfit. I mean, the shoes, the socks up to the knees, the skinny legs. <laughs> <laughs> and the hat or pal helmet, I should say, and the rest of the accoutrements for a soccer player. Yeah, it, it, shorts and everything. And of all the participants in those murder dinners, Arlo was always the best costumed person or costume character. He was a great sport in that regard. It'd be great if I had some pictures of him dressed like that, but I don't. I'd like to tell a few stories. It will just be, uh, take a short time. Arlo called me one day and said, let's go up to the Felicianas and look for some old country stores, the old time country stores, you know, with the pl plank floors and the everything under the sun in it to sell. Now, being growing up on a farm, of course, he had, was accustomed to country stores. And of course, his interest in historical objects did this, so I, I joined him and we actually did find three. I suppose they're all gone by now, but uh, 
I think, you know, under this, this, res this idea resonated with him, as I said, because he grew up on a farm in his interest in history, but we found three. And on another occasion, he came into my office one day and he said, Ed, let's go have lunch in Scott. I said, where in the world is Scott? He says, just on the other side of Lafayette. Why do we want to go there? He says, they've got the best boudin in Louisiana. So we did. It was a great lunch. <laughs> One last story I'll mention involves the theater. Uh, when one of our group became wheelchair bound, Arlo would go to his house, pick him up, get him in the car, fold up the wheelchair, put it in the trunk and drive to the restaurant where we would all meet together for dinner before theater. Then he'd take him out over to the theater, get him in the theater, out of the theater, and then bring him home. Now, the interesting thing about this is Arlo, well, we all know the size Arlo was. He was not a big man, but this man he hauled around was about 200 pounds and six foot tall. Arlo was a real trooper in that regard. So that's part of being generous. Now, I've told you about our safe social interaction with Arlo and Eunice, and they certainly had other groups of friends, for example, the astronomy group and others. Uh, but I think I go back to the, the longest, 56 years. At the remembrance for Arlo, it was stated that he was a true gentleman, a man with great character, who was humble, respectful of others, friendly and compassionate, and at that time was added generous. And I'd like to address this last attribute and then close. Uh, Arlo had a list of lists he contributed to, to every year. We compared notes. He was extremely generous, and in comparison, I felt like a tight one. He contributed to the college and to the department every year as well. And lastly, he took his entire family to an all expense paid Western dude ranch to celebrate Eunice's 80th birthday. At that time with five daughters and 13 grandchildren, he now has six great grandchildren. It came to about 30 people, quite a bill I would imagine. Arlo was a great man, great family man, a great astronomer. And for me, Arlo was a great friend. Back to you, Manos. Thank you, Ed. That was uh, wonderful. It's a great human being. I appreciate you for those stories. Um, and uh, we have James Clem as well, who we, who worked with closely with Arlo for years. And uh, I'd like James to say a few words before we close. Thanks, Manos, and thanks for squeezing me in. Uh, pretty much everything in terms of what Arlo was and what he did has already been mentioned. I just want to share some personal stories about my time with him and, and of all the people who've spoken, I've known him the least amount of time, but I can't tell you how much he's impacted my life during that time and shaped my professional life and who I'm to this day, uh, being his postdoc for seven years. So one of the funniest things I remember about Arlo is that every day at lunch, he would always go to the corner room at the conference room on the corner of the second floor and he would eat the same thing every day for lunch. It would be an apple, a piece of string cheese and some almonds. And the funniest thing was, is just a couple of years ago when the pandemic first started and Mano, she started doing these Zoom calls to have the, the weekly lunch sessions, is that I would remember seeing him in the camera eating his cheese, apple and almonds. But the funniest thing was, is after he finished his lunch, what would happen? He would fall asleep in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> And I tried to send him a message. I was like, wake up, Arlo, wake up. And I don't know if he got it or not on the Zoom call. But uh, the couple of other funny stories apart from, yes, he would get extremely frustrated at his computers. But people don't understand. That, and, and Jeff really kind of gave us this impression by doing a tour of Arlo World was that walking into that room or walking into his office was like stepping back in time. Uh, modern observational astronomy is light years 
easier to do today than it was 60 years ago when Arlo was doing it. And people don't understand that he would tell me stories about how after 14 or 16 hour nights having to stay up and develop the photographic plates that he had taken throughout the entire night. And sometimes these would be tens or hundreds of plates. And it was just unreal how much effort and dedication that he put forth to for for the community this was a selfless effort that he did and he devoted his life to it um when i was started traveling to chile in his place and when i first arrived in 2006 i remember going up to the mountain the first time and some of the resident observers the service observers found out who i was and they started calling me landolito and <laughs> so i had the nickname of landolito and then the uh, resident, not the resident astronomers, but the visiting astronomers would find out that I was working for Arlo and they would be so upset because it was like every time Arlo would come to the telescopes, it would get cloudy. So they were worried that I would also see, bring the same, the same bad luck. Um, <laughs> just he had such a reputation and, and I distinctly remember doing my interview with him for the postdoc position that he was advertising for. It was around the middle of 2005. And um, I know for a fact it was right before Katrina hit in New Orleans because it was in the summer. So it was before that. And I remember getting on the phone and just being like I was talking to a movie star, like I was talking to Brad Pitt or Mel Gibson or somebody like that. That it was such an influential phone call for me to be interviewing for a job with the man who was Landall and had such a reputation in the community. And I spent seven years in that little office outside of his and slowly over time, I think I got more and more encroached with more and more of his stuff, but I always found a way in and out of that office. And I'll never forget his kindness, him bringing me a coffee from the main office um, and just, just chats and going down for ice cream, like Ed said, professionally, Brad and Jeff and, and, and Johan nailed it. And personally, Ed nailed it. And there will never be a man who was more giving and more generous and more formal, but also just fun, just a fun person to be with. And that's it. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much, James. And I want to thank you, everyone, for um, I think what I think is a, a great seminar today. Um, and we all have to remember that the astrophysics seminar was very dear to Arlo's heart. So Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll be proud of us. Uh, so again, thank you all for your time and for, for sharing these stories with us. This video is recorded and it will be available for everyone and for the history of the department if need be. Thank you. So you can I can I add a couple of comments? I, yes. I have been to one of those country stores that Ed was talking about in Ethel, Louisiana. I don't know if that was one of those that you visited, but it's an incredible place. But it's been a few years since then. I don't know if it still is around. And, but I can guarantee that the best boudin in Louisiana still is obtainable at Scott. And boudin and crackling, the best that you can get in Louisiana. It certainly is. And you know, at that one of those country stores we got, Arlo talked me into buying a big cast iron cooker. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, as we were driving home, he was snickering and, he, and I said, why? He says, wait till your wife sees, Joe, my wife sees that. She's not going to want it. It weighs 40 pounds, empty. <laughs> and he was right. But he thought that would be a nice, fun thing to play on me. <laughs> so, so a graduate student here, uh, Courtney, is asking whether the Boudin place in Scott uh, exists still. Yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's visible from the interstate. What is it called? Um, I forgot. Yeah, I don't know what it's called because I, I just know what it is. And uh, <laughs> so it is, you, you come off uh, on the Scott exit and you, you go uh, left crossing the interstate to the Scott side. And then immediately you turn left and you pass um, uh, Harley Davidson, store with motorbikes and right and behind it is this butcher and uh and, and place where they they sell you the 
the the the the, the crackling and and many other things, not just crackling and bulan. They have other very well prepared meats. Just, just stop at a gas station and say, where is the best boudin in the world? Yeah. <laughs> right. Anybody else wants to add anything? I just wanted to add one more thing in saying it, that I, I think based on everything. Eric posted the link here on the Boudin Air Place. If anybody's interested, it's in the chat window. I, I'm asking, I'm not sure. Oh. I think there is a competition on the chat about who's going to find the Boudin Place. There's a uh, Gabby just <laughs> another link. That's a question, not an answer. <laughs> I think it's Billy's Boudin and Crackling. I don't think so. Have <laughs> done. I will look it up on the specialty. Right. John can email all of us. So, James, are you uh, just lazy or is he gone now? I think he lost he's his connection. Under the weather with, with the phone COVID call. or? Huh? I think he may have gotten a phone call uh, or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. All right. Well, well, this was great. Was great. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.